Hello everyone, I'm David Smith. I'm the Chief Officer of 15 Square. 15 Square is a UK charity and it started life in 1995 as Norm UK. I was there at the very first meeting I've been involved ever since. It was originally just designed to help men who'd been distressed by circumcision and who wanted to restore but it's gone on to be a much bigger organization and we help intact men with problems with their foreskins to solve it without losing them. Um, we deal with men who've been affected physically by circumcision and psychologically. We run all sorts of meetings and we are doing quite a lot of research. We've also had medical students on placement so we are we're we are quite a, a, a varied organisation. Um, I'm now going to hold a hand over to my a colleague, Jason Metters, who will tell you a little bit more about himself. Uh, and I've been with uh, 15 Square as the project manager since 2000 and... Uh, About three years ago. Yes, yeah. 2018. Uh, so, and I've been absolutely fascinated by the subject. So today we're going to be talking about the legal side of uh, circumcision specifically. Um, and Peter uh, is, uh, well, on a similar mission over in the US, I believe. So over to you, Peter, as well. Yes, uh, Victor, we could hear you talking. I just uh, mentioned, mentioned that. Um, yes, uh, so hi, everybody. It's good to see you, uh, uh, at least in two dimensions. Uh, we know you're there. Um, yeah, I'm Peter Adler, and I'm a lawyer in the United States and uh, a law professor. I'll be talking later, and I'll turn it, uh, turn it, turn it back to uh, to, to the English uh, group. Thanks, uh, Peter. So uh, today, uh, the reason we're doing a bit of a U.S. and U.K. Uh, tandem thing is because there's there's a lot of commonalities uh, with this subject across the world. Um, but specifically, we're going to be talking about some U.K. cases today, um, and uh, some of the obstacles to justice. Uh, so that's going to be the first part of our talk. Um, at 15 Square, we've identified five uh, real areas that we believe are really holding back any form of true uh, justice. Um, and just to talk briefly about the, the, the issues at hand, uh, I mean, in, in the US, and uh, Peter's going to be talking about this, and in the UK, there's already a plethora of information and legislation that tells people how they're supposed to act and how they're supposed to treat their child. And a lot of the different aspects around uh, even co the consent issues of circumcision. Um, however, we often find that each of these, um, thank you, David, uh, each of these uh, legislative um, frameworks that's been set up, they still aren't fully upheld within a judiciary system. Uh, so I'd like first to open up this by just talking about um, the record keeping. Now with circumcision, uh, obviously um, it, things are very country to country, but in the UK on the National Health Service, it is not allowed uh, to, it's not permissible to have non-therapeutic uh, circumcision. Uh, in other words, ritual or cultural circumcisions on the health service. However, there are instances where this happens, and we believe that there's a lot more of this going on than people realize. Uh, but the problem is, legally speaking, there's no repercussion for any doctors who do do this, providing they put down, which they're often incentivized to do, um, that it was a therapeutic reason. So we call this uh, the perfect lie, because not only are there instances where people are uh, from faith backgrounds going to their doctors about minor problems, um, or, or no problem at all, but indicating that they come from a culture where a circumcision would be part of their background. And the doctors are incentivized to still put down that there's a therapeutic reason or even a prophylactic reason, for instance, uh, when there's physiological phimosis, which of course is uh, a natural part of all voice development and absolutely no indication uh, for uh, any form of surgery. So this almost makes it impossible to then take up legal repercussions against the doctor because always they'll have written that it was for a, a therapeutic reason when this is known to be not true. Uh, and David has a story uh, around this, around someone who's recently been in touch with 15 Square. Yes, uh, this happened last year, I think. 
and it was a family living in the middle of the UK. Um, the father was from an Islamic background, not practicing Islamic background, and they had two sons. And uh, the eldest son at the time was about six, and the youngest one was two. And the eldest son complained that he was having pain with his in the penis. <coughs> Pardon me. They uh, took him to the doctor, and the doctor said that it could be phimosis. And um, they thought that probably a circumcision might cure it. They would try alternatives, but suggested the circumcision. The parents said, well, we come from an Islamic background. It's something that perhaps we may have thought of. Um, so uh, it was then agreed. The, um, they had a younger son who at the time was two. So they said, could this possibly, by Moses, could this possibly affect the younger one as well? So the doctor examined him and said, well, yes, he probably has got phimosis. So we'll book them both in at the same time. Um, both boys are now, well, they're currently about 18 and 14, um, and they're both deeply distressed about it. But the parents have no recourse at all. Um, they feel that they were duped, so they weren't given the right information. So this is, this is an ongoing thing we're trying to help them with. Their medical records are sketchy. Uh, they have nowhere to go really. So um, that's one of the that's one of the problems we're currently dealing with. And this is an instance of direct uh, misrecording because even if there were a more significant issue with the older son, the younger son who had absolutely no issue whatsoever uh, was also recorded as a therapeutic phimotic circumcision so the misrecording is pretty prolific and we've got many many examples of this in the 15 squares database uh, following on from this apart from the misrecording is also the mislabeling of pathology so we have identified a, something called an n47.8 this is a code that's used within medical um, terminology uh, which is covering redundant prepuce um, now, a redundant prepuce is a completely meaningless term. Uh, it means that this foreskin is slightly longer than what you'd expect to cover the entire of the glands. Uh, but there's no, I, at least we can't find any example of, of a pathology relating to this. And any pathology that does exist, isn't, uh, there isn't a hard line between that and a normal, slightly longer foreskin. Uh, especially as during like younger years, uh, there's so much room for development and change uh, that, that if this is used and, and put on someone's uh, medical records, it's absolutely non-existent as a pathology, yet it still makes the doctor uh, able to record something as a therapeutic circumcision when that's completely not the case. Uh, this is something we're investigating further and uh, we don't really know enough about this yet because um, it's, it's something we've recently started looking mm -hmm. into. Uh, however, I've taken a quote from the National Health Service, uh, one of the trusts in the UK, uh, and it makes for quite interesting read. Uh, it says, uh, the NHS Vale of York CCG routinely uh, commissioned circumcision if there is evidence of one of the following clinical indications. And they give a lot of interesting good uh, indications, I suppose. Uh, but one of them that stood out, which was absolutely wrong, in our opinion, was redundant prepuce, phimosis, uh, sufficient to cause ballooning of the foreskin on urination um, and paraphimosis. So this is all under the same tag. It puts redundant prepuce, phimosis, paraphimosis and ballooning all under the same issue. Now, ballooning is something that uh, 15 squared don't think is ever really an independently um, of itself a reason for circumcision. Uh, and even though at the end of that, uh, the, the list, of reasons for circumcision, they do say uh, that they should rule out physiological phimosis, so the natural phimosis present in all boys at birth through to the age of up to 17, as, is, as the oldest thing it's been recorded, mm -hmm. possibly higher, but it's not been recorded that far. Um, so there's a real issue there. They've not only lumped in uh, an issue that we don't think is a cause for circumcision, but they've also pathologized this redundant profuse idea. And I think that 
moving forward, if we as people who would advocate against the reckless and over prescription of circumcision, um, we need to get rid of this redundant abuse. And that will allow legal cases where people have been circumcised for reasons uh, that they weren't happy with. It will bring back doctors uh, a level of legal, um, not indemnity, what's the word, culpability, legal culpability for performing circumcisions that the children aren't happy with. Um, and David's going to talk more to bring it a bit more back towards the legal uh, side of things with the, the legal challenges. Yeah. Um, do you want to do you want to come in on, be, on that before we, we go any further, Peter? Uh, no, no, you, you go ahead. OK. okay. Um, right. The legal challenges. Um, this is another interesting one that we we come across quite frequently. It's where we, it's invariably teenage boys come to us. They've been circumcised quite often. They've had a non-therapeutic circumcision and they are very upset about it and they want to take legal action. And we've had a number of cases. And first of all, we say to them, you need to get a copy of your medical notes and your medical notes should say that you've had a non-therapeutic circumcision. Uh, if they don't, then you're on a hiding to nothing if they say you've got phimosis. Um, and then obviously, I think in the UK, the statute of limitations says you, you've got, I think, until 21 to bring the case. I may be wrong there, but I think it's 21. And also, then there's the cost of the case. So which, uh, which lad under 21 has really got all the experience plus the money or resources behind him? Uh, we had a very interesting case, and it was about six or seven years ago, where this was a 19-year-old. He knew he'd had a non-therapeutic operation because his parents told him. They had the same family doctor, um, and um, he got his medical records, and it clearly indicated that the circumcision had been non-therapeutic. Um, the next stumbling block was the cost of any case. And we scouted around and we were pretty sure that we could get quite a number of people who would be willing to, to fund his expenses. So we were, we were very hopeful, but we could not get, or, or he couldn't, and we couldn't find anybody willing to take on the case. It was, a, it was a case nobody wanted to get involved with. So it failed at the last hurdle. So that's another example of, you know, somebody really wanting to, take the case he got all the evidence and couldn't go any further so and based on on these kinds of, of issues like this idea that no one wanted to take the case further um brings us to kind of the, the fourth point that we think is really holding back any form of legal challenges to uh some of some of the cases of you know circumcision uh that people have wanted to take forward and that's that the perception of public interest is a major hurdle uh, so, first of all, a lot of legal professionals who, want, who would touch that case would fear their careers, uh, despite it being the pursuit of justice, despite having all of the evidence in the right place, and the laws there to provide a framework for recourse, they're not, people aren't able to, to follow through with it because of this perception of the public interest being in favour of circumcision and against those who speak out against it. Now, uh, many people who are probably listening will be familiar with the case um, with Sir James Munby. Um, but for those who aren't, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, one of the quotes. And it's a lesser read quote, but one that I feel is really important to the enti in entire case. Um, to give background on the case, uh, there was a boy and a girl um, whose uh, parents, I, I believe they were in care, but Sir, Sir James Munby uh, was presiding over a case to work out whether the daughter had been subjected to FGM. I think they were being put up for adoption. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, and dur during the case, they, they, uh, there was someone who was vehemently convinced that a type 4 uh, incision had been made, uh, a slight scratch, uh, to the, the labia of the girl. Um, and they entered a bit of a debate with, with regards to the level of harm. And then the issue of male circumcision came into the court. Uh, and uh, James Munby had this to say on the case. 
society and the law, including family law, and I'm sure Peter's going to go into more detail on this later and say how we can move past this, um, and I'm hoping he will. Um, society and the law, including family law, are prepared to tolerate non-therapeutic male circumcision performed for religious or even purely cultural and conventional reasons, while no longer being willing to tolerate FGM in any of its forms. There are, after all, at least two important distinctions between the two. FGM, FGM has no basis in any religion. Male circumcision is often performed for religious reasons. I would argue that in a secular society that shouldn't matter, but I'll continue without impeding the quote. Uh, FGM has no medical justifications and confers no health benefits. Male circumcision is seen as by some, although opinions are divided, as providing hygienic and prophylactic benefits. Be that as it may, reasonable parenting is treated as permitting male circumcision. Now, first of all, like the, the idea that uh, this should actually impact a legal structure, which is supposed to protect according to written law, not according to popular opinion, uh, that there is something important behind what is it, what he's saying, and that is that the public interest and the perception of, of uh, the public and the way circumcision is viewed is a key consideration for some pretty high-powered judges. Uh, and we, we would say this is a major issue. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple more of the cases um, where, where this has come to light. And there are major cases in the UK. Uh, and then David's going to talk more about what we were trying to do in order to try and bring that culpability back to doctors and to make sure there's a paper trail uh, in, for when society changes in the future. Um, this case is of Bill Vinder Mahat. He was a doctor um, who uh, had performed a circumcision on a boy against their mother's consent. It was the father and the grandmother that had been present. Uh, however, they didn't have the consent of both parents. Uh, police arrested the three agents, the doctor, the grandmother and the father, uh, on the request of the mother, who was horrified when she opened the nappy of the child and she had vocally spoken against wanting a child circumcised before. Uh, but the, the case was there. Everything, there was clearly a breach of consent. There were rules that are written that are not supposed to be broken. Uh, but the Crown Prosecution Service had this to say. Um, they deemed that there would be no realistic prospect of conviction. Uh, and in the same breath, they then said, uh, the doctor, uh, Balvinder Mahat may have failed in his professional obligations to discuss the issue of consent with you. Now that to me is quite illuminating because in any other context, failing to give consent uh, or uh, deeming that there would be no realistic prospect of conviction shouldn't really intervene if there is an actual uh, issue, a legal uh, a breaking of a law. Uh, but in this situation, because they thought that it wouldn't get uh, prosecuted or it wouldn't stand and they decided not to prosecute so what's the point in having anything written if you can't do anything about it because they think that it won't go through uh, and this is a big idea about where the the, the PR element and rec like getting the voices of men out there will actually hopefully influence the way courts start dictating over this there needs to be a bit of a cultural shift in favor of um, challenging circumcision in order for the courts to then feel confident to prosecute because right now they're impotent uh, and they're saying so in their own words that they can't even prosecute something where a clear law has been broken the second case um uh, well third case including the monby one um is the uh this one was actually pretty disturbing in a way because uh a 70 year old pharmacist in the uk uh Obi Uzon, uh, she was the director of a pharmacy, actually, so a very high, highly qualified professional, uh, 70 years old, lots of experience, clearly knew, knew exactly what she was doing when this happened. She took a child against the consent of their parents, which while she was babysitting, she took the child for circumcision, fully knowing that the parents would be against it and that they, weren't, they didn't want their child to be circumcised. She lied on the consent forms and managed to convince uh, a... Um, a professional in Golders Green to perform the circumcision uh, despite no alarm bells being triggered that a 70 year old woman was claiming to be the mother and the, ma the male that she had brought along just signing a consent form as a father um, was just some 
I mean, I, I don't think the, the details were ever was. found of who this was, but she just got a random witness. Um, anyway, this is one of the cases where in the UK, at least she was actually found guilty, um, which is, you might say that's great, that's fantastic. She clearly broke uh, some ethical boundaries as a citizen and as a medical professional who should have known better. Uh, but her sentence was a £1,500 fine. And bearing in mind, this is a director of a pharmacy. I mean, this is uh, this isn't a small salaried position um, and uh, a suspended sentence. And the, the judge, interestingly, found that her character was one of impeccable character and how she frequently helped um, help children. And she was an active member of her community. Uh, now, of course, these should be mitigating maybe mitigating factors in any case. And that's, you know, surely something that can be considered. But in terms of actually lying on consent forms in order to do something against the consent of both the child and the parent, uh, this is just such a paltry sentence. And there's another flagrant uh, disregard for any form of uh, legal repercussion or, or fairness or justice. So my takeaway from this and my kind of, uh, I, I think our, our stance is that Essentially, we need to show that there is public support for challenging issues surrounding circumcision and that it is not just seen as a cultural accepted uh, practice for all people, especially the men who feel psychologically and physically traumatized by their experiences from within and without the communities that practice this. Uh, so I'd like to just leave David with the final word on this, because this is what uh, 15 Square's experience was when trying to get the legal, uh, sorry, the medical professionals to leave a paper trail so we could later have legal recourse. Yeah. Um, in 2012, we had a meeting with the General Medical Council. It's the um, head of standards and ethics. There were quite a few people there. It took six years to get the meeting and we were given an hour. And during that time, uh, finally, there were the, the final uh, thing of the meeting, it was suggested there was a need for a formal registration of circumcisions to record who was circumcised, when, where, how and by whom. And they agreed that that was pretty essential to do and to move forward. Um, they, they challenged us to, well, they, they tossed us with sending a lot of information, which we did. Uh, they ignored all previous letters until six months later we'd, and emails. We did a, a freedom of information uh, request and they had to acknowledge that they hadn't actioned anything. And they still haven't actioned it and that was 2012. So obviously the General Medical Council haven't been keen on pushing this, but this is something that we are going to jointly press to try and if we can at least get these recorded so there's a proper recording of the of a circumcision then at least we may hopefully be able to move that forward so i think that's really what we've got to say on this and, so. and just as a final remark as well uh, and i found this fascinating because i only found this out today um but I, whilst looking up what the um the the, li the time limit is for medical records which i thought were for life um the, in the UK, the minimum term for, uh, I think is eight years, eight to 10 years, depending on uh, the nature of the medical record before it can be just scrubbed off or discarded. Mm -hmm. Now with issues of circumcision, how can we ever find um, both legal recourse and evidence of harm in later life of people when all of those records are, are, are being discarded? throughout the, the growing stages of the boy who's been subjected to this surgery. Um, so it's just a food for thought. And I think that's another thing that needs to be tackled because with a paper trail, there can be some semblance of justice. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Peter, I would love to hear about the situ situation over in the US. Uh, so over and to how you. it contrasts. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, David and Jason, um, for your, wa your work and your talk today. Um, you know, largely about legal challenges. Um, so uh, the audience might be interested to know that I was born in Eng England. I'm English myself, as well as American. Um, I think it's important that we work together with our counterparts in England to the extent we can help understand, um, you know, the legal situation. Uh, so um, 
I've been an intactivist for 10 years. And as mentioned, I'm a lawyer and law professor, I actually teach a class about uh, circumcision and the law, um, which is great that I can. Maybe 10 years ago, I probably wouldn't have taught such a course, but now it's part of the public uh, discourse. Um, so um, I focus on legal issues as an intactivist. Uh, so today I, I wanted to talk about some principles of law um, and then about three litigation cases in the United States and um, also address how some of the challenges that David and Jason brought up might be possible to attack them. Um, so um, it's a, a foundational principle in law um, that every individual has the inalienable right to bodily integrity and self-determination. So uh, this dates back to the 1600s to um, uh, Blackstone's commentaries. And uh, I remember David Llewellyn being surprised that I cited somebody from you know, the 17th century, but um, Blackstone was a genius and he, he wrote down all the laws of England and, um, and he it was he who memorialized the English rule that, that uh, individuals have inalienable rights, they adhere to individuals, not to others. And um, the United States adopted all of uh, UK law in the 1700s. And so um, the UK law and US law are really quite similar. They're part of the common law tradition. Um, so uh, what is this right to bodily integrity? It's, it's the right to be free from intrusions into the body of any kind, um, no matter how great or small. So uh, even a pinprick of a person's body violates the right to bodily integrity. So then there's a corollary to that right is if you have the right to, to be left alone, that's the right to bodily integrity, not to have your body intruded upon, it follows that you have a right to self-determination. This is a concept of autonomy um, uh, and, and the right to make important decisions about one's own body for oneself. And it, it's the same as the ethical principle um, of autonomy. And so as mentioned, these rights adhere to individuals no matter the age. So there's Supreme Court cases in the United States that uphold that there's a right to bodily integrity and self-determination and that say that all constitutional rights that, it, that, that adults have, so do children. So when a child is born, it instantly has all these rights. That was a novel concept at one time, but, but not anymore. So uh, the child has the right to bodily integrity and the parents don't have the right to intrude into a person's body. Um, their child's body. They don't own their children. Um, at risk of repetition, these rights adhere to individuals, not to others. Um, all right. So then the question is, well, when is it justified to cut into another person's body? Um, and, um, you know, the religious reasons, they, they, don't, they don't begin to cut it or make it, if you will. Um, there is no right to intrude into a, another person's body for religious reasons. So the, the only uh, time it might be justified would be when, when it's performed by a doctor and, and what? Well, the, the child must, A, need the operation, and B, the operation can't be deferred. If it can be deferred, then it must be to respect the child's right of self-determination. The child has a right to be free from intrusions into the body and to make important decisions for himself, even if, if that means when he becomes 18 or 21. Um, and it must be necessary. So the only time it's okay to cut into a child's body is if the child needs the operation, the operation can't be deferred. And all more conservative methods of treatments have been tried and have failed. And moreover, it has to be in the best interest of the child. And the child would have chosen it for himself if able to choose. Um, so um, that uh, brings us to the, um, you know, the question of, uh, of what causes of action there are for unnecessary surgery. So um, 
unnecessary unnecessary surgery without cons consent. So let me back up. The male and female genital cutting and intersex genital cutting all need to be treated the same way from the medical and legal perspective. Um, well, first of all, the prepuce is a common part, regardless of gender. The foreskin of the penis and the clitoral hood are identical in early gestation, very similar in function and appearance thereafter. So they must be treated the same if they look the same, they do similar things. But moreover, these ethical and legal rules are a broad application. They're, they're broad. They're, um, the ethical rule, we, sorry, legal rule, we talked about the right to autonomy. Well, there's a parallel ethical rule. It's the same. There's not a rule about one part of the body that's different from these important ethical and legal rules about other parts of the body. They have to be treated the same. So um, what then are the causes of action for unnecessary surgery of any kind without consent? and of which genital cutting is a subset. And so I wrote an article on this. We, we haven't published it uh, with a, a German uh, scholar. He was a student of mine, so it was great to write an article with a student. He was just brilliant. Now he's in law school. And so um, we've said that cutting into a person's body is, is a prima facie case of assault, meaning it is assault, but there, there are excuses. When is it justified? So it's justified, which we said, if a doctor can justify it on medical grounds, show that it needed to be done and couldn't be deferred. But otherwise, it's never possible to justify it on medical, religious, or other grounds. And therefore, it is a battery. Um, so the first cause of action that, that these children, when they become men who've been circumcised, they, they have an action for a battery. Now, in 1985, there was an article by William Brigman um, and he said it, it violates the child abuse statutes in every state to circumcise a boy. And so it's also child abuse. And um, so in, it, in addition, there's a concept in medicine that physicians owe a fiduciary duty to their patients based on trust. So they have a duty to act in the best interest of the patient. What does that mean? They have to respect the patient's rights and they have to justify the operation. But they don't, as they, uh, you know, they in the UK and but a lot more in the US. Boys are circumcised even though they're perfectly healthy. So let's forget the famosis, lying, lack of consent, anything like that. Regardless, if you circumcise a healthy boy, it's it's assault and battery, which is a civil and criminal violation. Um, it's child abuse and it's breach of fiduciary duty. Then um, had let me just check the time yeah so i had sort of a big insight one day um, was i remembered from torts class back in 1983 the professor saying that that um the physician has a fiduciary duty to act in the best interests of a patient and if the patient alleges that the the physician violated that rule the physician has the burden of justifying the operation and you know, that was a big insight because the burden of proof often decides cases. Like if children have to prove something, that's harder than doctors have to disprove. It. So what I'm saying is lawsuits can be brought where the child says, you breached my, the trust that I placed in you. I, I trusted you would respect my rights. I trusted you would only operate on me when I needed the operation. You violated that. Then the burden falls to the physician to justify it. But as I said, it can't be done. All right, well, there's a concept then of constructive fraud. It's a little hard to explain, but it's a, it's a legal fiction. Basically, the courts are saying, well, you violated the trust of the child, and you may have done so trying to benefit yourself at the expense of the child. So we're going to assume, presume, impute fraud to you. And if you can't justify it, you're liable for constructive fraud even if you didn't intend to defraud anybody. So I think this is really important and it opens up channels for, um, for lawsuits. So in addition, um, I wrote an article with Robert Van Howe, this same man, Felix Van Howe and Travis Wisdom, published in November, 2020, um, arguing that circumcision is a fraud. So what do I mean by that? Um, 
So first, there's fraud in the hospital, a fraudulent conduct of putting pressure on parents to consent, giving them two minutes to consent, maybe not asking the mother in the United States. And moreover, the mother may be legally incapacitated and incapable of giving consent. And I, I, I sense this first, or I experienced this firsthand because when my son was born in 1987, a doctor said, have you decided yet whether to circumcise your son or not? So by saying that, he's sort of indicating there's an expectation that I should have thought of that when I never had, and I'd never needed to, never should have. He didn't even have the right to make that suggestion. He cut my wife out of the conversation. I, the way she looked at me, I tried to include her. She's a doctor, MD, PhD. She would have been involved for sure, but she was out of it. She'd just given birth and labored a long time on medications, and she was out of it. And doctors should know all this. So there's high-pressure sales tactics in the hospital that's fraudulent conduct. Then there are fraudulent medical claims, just as um, David and Jason um, talked about with the Famosis case. And Famosis is an, an outright fraud um, you know, to, to uh, put a label or try to claim that it's a therapeutic procedure because of a tight foreskin when a tight foreskin is normal often until um, a, a child reaches uh, puberty. And so, um, in my view, fraud case, in cases of intentional medical fraud can be brought where the doctor diagnosed phimosis when it was untrue. And the same with redundant prefus. Now, that's ridiculous. A long prefus, uh, there are long foreskins and short foreskins, there's nothing wrong with it. So, it's sort of clear evidence of, of a lie. And the doctor has a burden of proving, you, you know, what I'm saying, you bring a lawsuit, the doctor has to prove that redundant prepus was a therapeutic condition that required treatment, which they'll never be able to do. The same with phimosis, I suppose, in some cases, that it's true phimosis that, you know, and the last resort is circumcision. But even then, my understanding is that with stretching and steroids, it's hardly ever necessary to circumcise for phimosis. So in the U.S. as well, because Medicaid stopped paying for a lot of circumcisions at birth, physicians couldn't get paid to circumcise at birth. So there's been a big increase in the circumcisions of older children using this phimosis, this fraudulent phimosis diagnosis in the United States as well. Um, so I think uh, fraud cases can be brought. So in addition, there's, uh, I said there are four types of fraud. So we've had fraudulent conduct, fraudulent medical claims or medical fraud. Then you also have fraudulent legal claims. That's the claim that parents have the right to make the decision for any reason, religious, cultural, and personal reasons. It's a ridiculous argument. There's absolutely no truth to it. Parents don't have the right to intrude their body at their own will. They don't own their children. They can't cut off a finger if they feel like it or make an ear look like the father's ear. The reason often given is that parents choose circumcision so the child's penis will look like the father's penis. That's an absolutely ridiculous argument. It was actually the argument that first made me um, think that it might be a fraud and, and led me to doing um, research and writing these uh, law review articles. Um, the fourth part of the fraud is Medicaid fraud, um, that uh, in the United States, it's unlawful to charge Medicaid for unnecessary surgery. That's what doctors have been doing. And so um, they are committing Medicaid fraud. In order to get paid in the US, the doctor has to certify, has to sorry, provide the diagnosis and the medical indication, the reason for the surgery and sign it under penalties of perjury. And they all do that and they get away with it. And it's Medicaid fraud because the surgery isn't necessary. So um, let's see, time's quite short. I'm, I want to leave a little time to just any questions David and Jason might have or just to discuss this, so I'll be very quick. But we brought three lawsuits in the United States. One was brought by Eric Klopper, a Jew who put on an anti-circumcision play at Harvard. Um, and Harvard alumni didn't like him criticizing the Jewish ritual of circumcision, they fired him. He brought suit and the judge was completely biased. He played golf with the Harvard's attorneys. Um, he threw the suit out in a day and it's on appeal. The appeal's a great appeal. You know, win or lose, Harvard did wrong to Eric Klopper. We hope he wins. The second case is a Medicaid case that we brought on the lead counsel. 
And we just had a huge victory, we think. The state moved to dismiss our claim and said we have no right to proceed. The judge held we have the right to proceed with our case in Massachusetts. The judge sent it up on appeal, so I'm writing the appeals court brief. It's been a busy semester with these three lawsuits. So the third is a case has been brought against the American Academy of Pediatrics, accusing them of fraud in their 1989 articles, uh, 1989 guidelines, based on my, uh, my fraud paper. It's exciting to know that you can come up with ideas and, you know, they take hold. They're real. I mean, uh, there aren't many lawyers working on this, unfortunately, but I think we now have the legal framework uh, to bring to, to encourage suits and, and uh I'm writing a book that I'm going to encourage the public circumcised people to bring suit. Very last comment this um, about the cost. I don't think it's a negligent suit um, uh, malpractice, so it should be inexpensive. I think boys have the right to win on summary judgment without a trial. That's what happened in, in uh, the German case. And um, there's something called a discovery rule um, that ex extends the statute of limitations until the time you discover a fraud. So these phimosis cases that uh, Jason and David are talking about, those, those um, children may be able to sue um, when they reach adulthood or their parents on their behalf. It's not to say there aren't a lot of challenges in bringing lawsuits, but I think uh, you can see the highway opening up to uh, where there might be an avalanche of those lawsuits. So let me turn it in a few remaining uh, minutes uh, uh, to uh, David and Jason to continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank uh, you very much, Peter. Uh, some interesting points for us to take away as well, uh, the discovery law, for instance. Um, I, I think we need to be in touch with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. I'd like to actually... Oh. Oh, okay. is, this, is this the NL? Ah. Thank you, Peter. Okay, well, Thank you, Victor. Well, I think we'll be having further talks with, on this in the Peter. future. Thank okay, you well, so thanks. much, Victor. Thank you all. Have a Thank great you. day of uh, genital autonomy. <laughs> Goodbye.